Hello, my name is Captain Dennis Murphy, and I'm going to be telling you the story of the Exxon Valdez from a very personal viewpoint. I worked Prince William Sound for many years. I also ran the pilot boats the year before the crash, and I worked the summer of the oil spill and the two summers after working on the oil spill cleanup. So I have a very unique perspective on what went on. Well, if you're not sure exactly where Prince William Sound is, it's in what's referred to as South Central Alaska. It's in the middle of the picture down at the bottom of the state. The summer before the oil spill, I was driving the pilot association boats and what that was is I took the pilots out to the big ships and brought them back in. I ended up actually getting to know many of the individuals involved. I also drove a lot of different tour boats over the years there in and around Prince William Sound. Now the first summer of the oil spill, I ended up driving a little medic response boat. I drove the medics around to the different workstations to deal with anybody that might be injured or sick. I had an interesting perspective. I was able to wander all over the place, all over the whole length of the spill. The second and third summers I ran this boat. In the first year I was working for the oil company, the second, third year I was working for the environmentalists. And this was where they lived. And what really happened anyway? It's a pretty darn good story with some of the stuff you probably already know and some of the stuff you don't know. Well, of course, the reason that the oil spill happened is that the North Slow oil, crude is referred to, is brought all the way across Alaska to Valdez, where it's stored in large containers. At that point, the large ships would come in from the ocean, into Valdez, load up, and then they'd turn around and head back out again. One of the things about Prince William Sound is there is sometimes floating ice, which will come into the story as we move along. These oil tankers have a very specific way that they come and go through Prince William Sound. And most importantly, they pass by a place called Potato Point, which is where the Coast Guard radar station is. The radar can, if they had been watching, determine that Exxon Valdez was heading the absolute wrong direction. But nobody was watching at that moment. Also, the Exxon Valdez had a very toxic work environment. The AB was a gal who was on watch, and the third mate who was driving, he had a real problem with women on the boat. Even though the woman AB lookout had a more advanced license than he did, he wouldn't listen to her. Told her to get out of the wheelhouse, leave him alone, and locked the door after she went out. And then this is what happened. Ran into the, the reef there, Bly Reef. And if you look carefully here, you'll see the larger vessel is the Exxon Valdez, and the other one next to it is a full-size tanker. So that gives you an idea how big the Exxon Valdez was. What they're trying to do is they're trying to remove as much of the oil as they can before it all leaks out into Prince William Sound. So here they are pumping the oil off. As it worked out, the first three days of the spill was absolutely dead calm. Not a breath of wind, not a ripple on the water, not a cloud in the sky. It would have been perfect to see where they're going, pay attention, don't crash. But the third mate would not listen to the AB. So this is a pathway of where the Exxon Valdez goes, and you'll see where it hit. Unfortunately, nobody was paying attention in the Coast Guard station. They were not watching the radar, and the pilot had already left the vessel, so the pilot wasn't, was not on board. And this is the progression of the oil. This is where it was going. It migrated kind of southwest of Bly Reef. And you notice it didn't hit everywhere. It only went to some of the places. Other places had no effect whatsoever. And it took a number of days for the oil to migrate this far along the coast. Keep in mind that everything above the water, on the water, and below the water died. It killed everything. Now this heavy crude has a lot of aromatic hydrocarbons in it, which is gasoline, propane, that kind of stuff. So everything that breathed air died immediately. 
The heavy hydrocarbons like the tars and the asphalts, they sank out to the bottom and basically paved all of the bottom of Prince William Sound where the oil was. And then about the only thing you had left after a period of about two weeks was about motor oil consistency. And everything that came in contact with the oil died. Everything in sight, everything in the bottom, everything that swam in the top, everything that flew around. It was a most disturbing, unpleasant time in my life. Unbelievable amounts of stuff died. Everything died. And here's a chart of showing you at least the basic idea of what was affected directly or indirectly by this oil spill. It was truly heartbreaking being around all these animals that I had for years been taking tourists out to show and knowing that they were all going to die everywhere you looked. So why didn't they boom it? Well, the problem was there was too much oil. Booms only hang down 18 to 24 inches. Well, there was nine feet of oil that was around in the water outside of the tanker. So there was just physically too much oil to contend with. Now, what about the cleanup? What'd they do? Ooh, what a mess that was. Sometimes they used rags. Sometimes they used the water systems, which I'll show you here in a second. There it is. And what they did is they used a hot water blaster, which whatever was not killed by the oil was killed by the hot water. So they basically sterilized the entire beach. What they were thinking of doing is moving the oil offshore and picking it up. It wasn't until after they did it for a while that they realized that, well, sometimes a cure is worse than the disease to start. They literally sterilized the entire beach. Now there were some efforts of just trying to mop it up, but as it worked out they only recovered between six and nine percent of all of the oil that went in the water, just a tiny little bit. And the ecological disaster was amazing. And keep in mind during this time when they were trying to do cleanup, the oil was still leaking out. There it is, leaking out. And this is the intermediate weight oil that I was talking about, about uh, what you'd expect to be motor oil. That's all that was left after about two weeks. It was floating around and it was everywhere. And I mean everywhere. Even on the beaches it looked clean. All you had to do was dig a very small hole and there was the oil bubbling back. And this was the first year. This was the big spot. Moving along, of course, they were trying to collect oil. And as you collect the oil, you got to do something with it. Not only were they trying to collect it offshore, but of course they were wiping it up onshore like I showed you the pictures here a minute ago. And it affected everything along the entire path of where it floated away to, where it drifted to. Not just little places, but every place. Now you might be wondering why didn't they use dispersants? Why didn't they use some kind of a spray on it like they did down in the Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf of Mexico? Well, for a couple of reasons. One, you have to have a specialty permit, which the Coast Guard wasn't going to allow, or EPA wasn't going to allow. And secondly, well, there was just too much of it. It was everywhere. And this stuff just got on everything, and you could never get it off. If you got it on your clothing, it was there forever. Well, let's talk about another interesting aspect. There's actually three different sources of oil in Prince William Sound. Of course, you have the Exxon Valdez spill. Before that, you have the 64 earthquake, where there were gigantic oil storage containers, both in Whittier and in Valdez. And then the third source is oil coming from natural seeps. Oil just bubbles up out of the ground. And we had to determine which oil was what. As far as the animals were concerned, well, they didn't care. It was the same for all of them. The difference was that the Exxon Valdez was just so much more volume. Now keep in mind that for every animal that they tried to clean it cost about $10,000 and only about 2% of them lived. Now here's two years later. This is the third year after the Exxon Valdez and if you dig a little hole in the beach, out started bubbling the oil again. You might not have seen it, but it was still there. There was a monumental amount of trash generated during the oil spill. Now what do you do with all that trash? Well, you put it in bags and then what do you do with it then? Most of the bagged garbage from the oil spill ended up being sent down to uh, Central California, I think it was, and burned. 
what you're basically doing is you're changing one kind of pollution for another kind of pollution. You can't believe how much garbage was generated. And also think about the thousands of people that were working on the spill. Of course, all of them were generating trash also. Now let's talk about another one of my personal favorites, at least it used to be, a place called Cordova, Alaska, which is on the extreme eastern end of Prince William Sound. That's where a lot of the fish come from, Copper River Reds for one. And it really completely destroyed the community, the oil spill did. About half of the people went out there to clean up the oil, and about half the people said, no, we're not going to take your blood money. This is an interesting community. It's the longest continuously uh, lived in community of white community in Alaska. A lot of three generation families. And of course, the primary income for the area is different kinds of marine product uh, collection, either salmon or shrimp or herring or uh, a lot of different products which are used to be pulled out of Prince William Sound. About half of the community, like I said, went out there to clean up and it ended up that a year later, the ones that went out to clean up had new boats, new houses, new cars, everything paid for. The problem with a community like that is the people that didn't go out to clean up, the ones that just didn't want the blood money, they ended up losing their houses, losing their boat, losing their cars, and oftentimes lost their families. These people are still bitter to this very day at the change. Of course, some of the boats did go out there to help clean up. Generally speaking, the boats that went out to clean up, they ended up getting condemned because of the oil, so they could never again do fishing. So it ended up, they got new boats. So there is a lot of animosity there. Now what about after the spill? What came of all this stuff? Well, obviously oil is a biological product and all biological products do decompose. Some of the fish have started coming back. Remember that salmon, some of them are on a one year cycle, some are two year cycle, and some are three year cycle. So some of the salmon were not affected by the oil spill whatsoever. Now, in the areas where the oil went, of course, everything in the bottom died. So who's this guy? This is Hazelwood. Now, he was the captain, but you got to keep in mind that he was off watch. He was down in his cabin. He was not the guy driving. And there's a question about his drinking. Well, of course, the Coast Guard's policy is eight hours bottle of throttle. So he was good. He was golden. He got charged. The only thing that stuck on Hazelwood was a charge of not reporting an oil spill in a timely manner. That's the only thing he actually got slapped on. But keep in mind, he was off watch. He was not working. He was not the one driving. But he's the one that got blamed because, of course, he's the captain. So what happened to the Exxon Valdez? They took it to San Diego. They fixed the hole in the bottom. And another time I have a great story for you about the repair of the boat. But that's for another day and another group. They eventually did f completely rebuild it. They changed it, changed the name of it, and sent it back out. There's a lot of discussion on whether or not single hull vessels should be allowed at all anymore. Most all the vessels now are double hulls, but well, even if you had had a double hull vessel, there was such a big hole that wouldn't have helped anyway. You might ask, will we have another oil spill? I guarantee it. The only way that we can be assured of never having another oil spill is to stop our fascination with oil consumption. If we quit driving our cars and heating our homes, we won't ever have another oil spill. But of course, we need to be careful. Well, thanks for joining me. See ya.